about you know, financial inclusion and bringing new customers in. To do that, of course, requires partnerships, um, not just uh, partnerships at the technology le technology layer to um, you know make it more efficient, improve operational speed, but also partnerships with you know at the front end with you know with customers. Um, we're going to move into the partnership domain now. Uh, we're going to welcome back Amna Ajmal from Mastercard. And please welcome Amna back to the stage for the next session. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Smita Ghosh, and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of a fintech startup called Kashi. And just to touch upon financial inclusion, we are working towards um, financially including children in the Middle East. So that was just a coincidence. But um, thank you, everyone, for your time to be here as we start on a very interesting discussion about partnerships this morning. It's no secret that we live in an incredibly dynamic part of the world. The UAE was ranked 10th globally in the IMD World Competitiveness Report in 2023. And Saudi was ranked 17th globally as well, so really up there um, in the global stage. The Vision 2030 of Saudi Arabia, which happens to be an 85-page document, I just found out this yesterday, by the way, uh, mentions the word partnerships over 20 times, highlighting the importance of exactly that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So today's session is about harnessing the potential of partnerships and driving MENA's global competitiveness. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel today. And um, you know, I'm, I'm especially always happy to moderate all women panels, and it, it is so today. So I'd like to introduce Amna Ajmal the Executive Vice President, Market Development, EMEA MasterCard. <laughs> and Neza Alawi. Neza is a CEO of Women Choice, a New York-based organization working closely with Fortune 500 companies, governments, and institutions in advancing diversity. So welcome to both of you. Great. So I, I guess without further ado, I'm just going to jump right in. We've got, a, we've got a lot of questions lined up today. So my first question for Neza would be, Neza, your mission is to create over one million jobs for women in the Middle East. And you've signed a partnership with MasterCard. Can you tell us a little bit more about this amazing initiative? Thank you. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, to take on a pledge of uh, connecting one million women to jobs in MENA region, let me tell you how I'm going to do it. It's going to be 100% based on partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. So I think we're going to be able to explain here how to achieve that. And I would like to thank MasterCard. But more than that, I'm not herself who has been leading this partnership because beyond the brands, and I can say that MasterCard is definitely a champion much more advanced than other companies when it comes to advancing sustainability and diversity and inclusion. But it also takes leaders within the company. And, and Amna has played an amazing uh, role, so she'll be able to explain also the other side of uh, the partnership making. So um, in order for you to achieve your target of you know, creating one million jobs for women, um, you know, partnership with MasterCard is really critical. How else are you going to use the power of partnerships to actually execute this on ground? So we have three types of partnerships that we're looking for. One, 
the financial partnerships because you know it's Mita yourself as a, an entrepreneur or myself as a social entrepreneur. It's, it's something important that we shouldn't neglect. The second one is expertise partners. So we have some, uh, you know, top four consultancy uh, uh, companies as expertise partners and then employment partners. Employment partners, MasterCard, uh, actually MasterCard is also going to be an expertise partner because they will provide us with their, the MasterCard Academy content for, for the women. So, so this is how we implement it. So we have enough funding to be able to identify the women beneficiaries and give them a value. Then we source expertise to be able to stay lean and, uh, and, and um, grow the value. And then employment partners are companies who take a pledge with us to actually employ these women. Thank you, Nazad. I, could, I couldn't have said it better. You've said it so succinctly. Uh, thank you for that. M my next question will be to Amna. Amna, there are key factors that drive global competitiveness. And like I mentioned, the UAE and Saudi are at that level right now. So we're looking at things like fostering public-private partnerships, building a robust digital and physical infrastructure, enhancing productivity, improving capacities for SMEs, empowering women entrepreneurs, among others. And Amna, you've been driving several partnerships over the past few years. Can you share from your personal experience how some of these partnerships with fintechs, retailers, telcos, etc., are sharpening the region's competitiveness edge in the, in the global arena? Sure, um, thank you. So, um, first of all, I'm also happy to, this is my first all-women panel, <laughs> so really happy for that. Um, so I think, uh, I, if I just take a little bit of a step back, a lot of organizations are transitioning from a product-centered organization to a solution-centered organization. Okay. And I think this trend um, is very, very helpful and positive because when you're structured as a product organization, your platform, your tech stack is actually powering those individual products, right? And when you move to a solution-centric organization, these individual product platforms, they start talking to each other. Data starts flowing. And then it's very easy to actually harness the true power of partnership. So a great example that I would give is our partnership with HSLAT, which rebranded itself as EAND. Um, a great digital transformation journey that you can see it coming to life from a telco to a techno. This was not possible, I would say, even seven years back. A telco is providing you with a device, a data, a top up, and that's pretty much the role of a telco. But if you look at now what Ian has been able to achieve, and they're a partner of MasterCard, it's humongous. They have the data, they have the trust, they have the right brand. Um, they launched a prepaid card. They want to address the lower part of the pyramid, who's not part of the financial inclusion today, and take SME as an opportunity that telcos can address, and Ian in this part of the world, but also in Africa, Airtel and MTN are addressing. Um, only in the Arab part of the world, the financing gap for SMEs is $123 billion. Wow. Okay. If a small part of this gap is addressed, we can create 8 million jobs just in this region. So going back to uh, Neza's point, it's about having those pragmatic, impactful goals. Yeah. Like she is not just doing a program, but she has an, a very tangible, impactful goal of 1 million jobs. Um, and that partnership then enables us to drive that common goal. EAND is in a very similar way. They have a very powerful, uh, impactful, tangible goal that they want to address this segment of the country in UAE, be it the gig workers, be it the SMEs who are excluded, a focus on women entrepreneurs, which is something that's very close to us at MasterCard because we made a global pledge to include 50 million SMEs into the digital economy by 2025, wow. and half of them will be women. Wow. So I think when two organizations come together who have the same vision, the same mission, and then the technology underneath is empowering you because you have the data, you have the platform talking to each other, then the kind of experiences you can create, the kind of value you can create, it's a humongous and it's very powerful. And the last very short part that I would add is that 
10 years back, the barriers for industries were very, very high. So it was not easy for a non-banking organization to say, I want to be a bank. Uh, in fact, I was a banker in my past life. If somebody would tell me in 10 years back, I want to be a bank, I would laugh. Like, why would you want to be a bank? You know, it's, a, uh, it's not an easy situation to be in. And how would you be a bank? You know, it's regulations, it's, uh, it, it's a compliance. It's, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with all of the nightmares, trust me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But you see now, retailers, telcos, uh, so many of customers of mine, because I look after the non-financial institutions in this region, they have that ambition. And I think it complements the financial institutions because these non-financial institutions, solution-centric, have the data, the right goals, vision, mission, a great set of talent and leadership, and they don't have the legacy infrastructure they're able to drive financial innovation and address the segment that, to your earlier point, uh, is really not being addressed from a financial inclusion standpoint. Thank you, um, Amna. I think the way you visualized what, what it is that you're doing with EAND was, was really profound, you know, to saying you guys have, the, have a shared mission and vision and you have the technology that's empowering that versus the other way around, which is, you know, which is brilliant. Um, you mentioned a point... You mentioned a point about um, financial innovation, and maybe if, if you know if it's okay, I'll just sort of ask you the next question on that one. So we know that digital payments help unlock innovation and growth across multiple sectors, including fintech. So what are some of Mastercard's emerging technologies and partnerships um, in the regional payment landscape that enables that? Sure. Um, so um, first of all, I think it's very hard in today's world to. Uh, keep up building your own product. So as a company, we rely a lot on acquisitions okay. um, and partnerships. So a lot of companies that we have acquired actually give us that capability to serve our clients as well as actually complement uh, their products and capabilities. Um, if I just look at um, uh, Mina, 85% of the customers as per our research in the last one year have used at least once in a year a new payment method that they did not use before. This could be buy now, pay later, it could be a digital wallet, it could be biometrics, it could be pay by link, a QR code. So the first very common trend that's actually helping and enabling us is that consumers are embracing new technologies. And for a lot of these consumers, even basic services are new technology because they've never had access to it. Yeah, and, and there has to be a consumer adoption. Now, maybe pandemic accelerated that because people were out of their comfort zone. They had to try new technology. But you see the trend is staying, right? There is an openness to embrace new technologies. That's one. And the second I would say is um, that if you look at um, the payment industry, it will become a $3 trillion industry in the next three years. That's huge. But really the backbone of that is that like, companies like us, our partners, my clients, they are investing in technology with the use case in mind, right? If I say that, oh, I need to drive scale in artificial intelligence, that's like saying I would drive scale with internet. You know, like artificial intelligence a few years down the road would be like internet, right? But the most common trend, and that's how MasterCard is thinking about products and solutions is, what is the pain point that I'm solving, right? What is the problem that I'm solving? And I personally passionately believe innovation is about making extraordinary things ordinary. Mm -hmm. That's when you achieve scale. You know, you're solving a simple pain point. It could look great and extraordinary, but actually it becomes a very ordinary thing over a period of time. Like all of us would remember when we had Blackberries, yeah. nobody ever thought that, you know, typing is such a big problem, your thumb aches, right? Yeah. But when iPhone came and it took all that over, it, it was a huge unset problem solved. So I think that's the product mindset we have, and I see a lot of my customers having the exact same mindset. Got it. And that, that's, I think, uh, together with consumers embracing new technologies, these two trends together would really enable us to drive innovation and uh, innovation at scale. Got it. Thank you for that, Amna. Um, my next question is for Neza because we've, you know, we've talked about, you know, um, about all the positive um, things about partnerships. I'd like to touch upon some challenges now. So, Neza, what are the key challenges and opportunities 
in your opinion, for businesses in the MENA region to collaborate with global partners for mutual growth and competitiveness? And can you provide examples of, of successful partnerships that have been working for you? And perhaps maybe some challenges that you may have faced. I, I think the challenge when you're an entrepreneur is, uh, and, and I'm not touched a uh, point about it, it's, uh, you're so much in the agility of developing your business that you get frustrated by the corporation processes and, and you don't take the time to also understand the culture and the pressures, the dynamics of corporations. So I, myself, with this uh, big vision of trying to change the world, you know, had to take the time to, to learn, and I do it through executive courses at Harvard, where I find myself with uh, 80 executives for one week in the room, and, and in those dynamics, I, I learn about how to deal with corporations. So, uh, so yeah, so that's the main challenge between partnerships, um, corporations, and, but I've been in this space for over a decade, and I've seen the culture change. Corporations are how, much- How so, how so? Uh, well, corporations are much more open to, to building those partnerships okay. with, with other startups. And uh, so, so that's one thing. And then the other change that I've seen in the culture of corporations is really, and you know, Jitex is having Jitex impact now. So uh, companies are much more uh, aware of ESG, sustainability, and so on, which was not the case 10 years ago. Uh, even if they uh, were aware of it, they didn't have the budgets for it, and so on. So uh, the, another challenge is uh, same as here. It's, it's also the, the, the timing, understanding the calendar, of the budget, understanding the, the, the process that can sometimes take uh, uh, six months if you're going through, you know, like the, the, the route and again, you don't find the, the proper leaders within the corporations that support you on that. But I will say for myself that I have moved, made the choice to move from New York to Dubai two years ago because I need innovation. Uh, as an environment to be able to scale my initiatives for scalability reasons, but also for tangible reasons, because innovation gives you the, the capacity to, to actually um, be able to measure the results. And uh, so, so I find it that in MENA region now, there is really a growing environment that has been inspired by Dubai, UAE, but it's, it's really uh, spreading into other countries uh, where they want to be at the forefront of innovation. And as a social impact innovator, uh, yes, I find that there is a lot of uh, changes happening here. I think some of the challenges that you mentioned, Neza, I mean, they hit right home with me because <laughs> I'm facing the same with, you know, with the partnerships that we have. Um, you know, that's fantastic. And uh, Neza, I mean, you know, one more question to you is, um, how do you think, uh, what role does innovation play in fostering partnerships and enhancing competitiveness in the region? Sorry, if you can repeat the question, what role? What role does innovation play for yes. you in yes. fostering partnerships and enhancing competitiveness in the region? Yes, it's a little bit what I said earlier, but I'll, I'll get deeper in it. It's innovation gives you the ability of scalability. And, uh, and, and you know, if you want to touch a maximum people, uh, and also innovation on with the scalability part gives you the ability to also come and approach corporations uh, with something that is more innovative than what they have been having within the company because of the legacy part, because of the, 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 the ROI that doesn't always uh, give you the time and ability to, to, to be focus, at the forefront yeah. of innovation. Yeah, okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Um, my next question is for Amna. Amna, digital payments help unlock um, innovation and growth across multiple sectors, including fintech. And what are some of MasterCard's emerging technologies um, and partnerships that enable that? Maybe I would just uh, add a little bit to what uh, Neza was talking about, challenges and opportunities. Uh, she articulated it very well. Um, I think one of the um, 
challenge which is now turning into an opportunity um, is that we always look for what we don't have. So big organizations, uh, they have the scale, um, distribution, customer base, data. And they look for agility. In every yeah. big corporation, and I'm not an entrepreneur, uh, I've always been with corporations, and I love when I talk to entrepreneurs, they're always talking about agility. They're talking about speed to market. Um, but they have that. They're talking about that for corporations to have. And it's true. At, at, in a corporate world, we always talk about how can we be like fintech? How can we have speed to market and the agility? Uh, and if you look at the fintechs, um, from their own perspective, they're looking for scale, for data, for access to customers, you know? So, um, the fact that one party is looking for agility and scale, which is like corporations, and the other one is actually looking for scale and access to distribution and customers, um, for me, the biggest opportunity, and Nessa pointed it out, you see a lot happening in this region, are these collaboration models. And that will really, really, truly help not only entrepreneurs and SMEs who are looking for opportunities, but there's a huge openness now from big corporations to realize and acknowledge they cannot solve all problems by themselves. So they have to partner with the SMEs, with entrepreneurs, with the fintechs. So I, I think that uh, is happening a lot in this region. Uh, before this, I had worked in the US, and I think um, because of the nimbleness of a region, because of uh, how so many companies are looking at this part of the world to be to, to like even move here yeah. and uh, and headquarter their business over here because of the regulatory environment, because of the focus of the government, that will be, drive huge innovation at a much faster pace and scale for our region. I just I wanted to add that to what <laughs> Neza said. That's a really good point, Amna. Maybe a question from my side because you mentioned a really important point where you know, big businesses like MasterCard are looking at partnering up with entrepreneurs to, to get that, you know, speed and agility. How are they managing the lack of that internally to work with entrepreneurs, to work at the speed of entrepreneurs? So, I think there are two things. First, a very structured program. Okay. Right? Like, uh, we have a startup program where we would actually onboard these startups and the whole idea, uh, we would also kind of equip them with the tools, but do some kind of a minority investment at times in them, because we see that not only investment from an ROI standpoint, but there's a strategic kind of a vision oh, yeah. that we can achieve together. Shared right? vision, yes. Absolutely, yeah. and they can complement our assets, even though they're small, but they have created something that uh, can offer an amazing experience to an SME or to a consumer. So that's a very structured kind of program that exists. You know, Same in the space of women SMEs, from small things like celebrating women SMEs. Um, I host an annual women SME awards. We take SMEs from across the region. We encourage them to talk about their achievements because I think women have a fundamental issue in talking about their achievements, uh, which I think comes very naturally to men. Um, and we encourage them. And I, I think that eye-opening experience for us and Last year, I, one of the Women SME Awards that we gave at MasterCard um, was a lady from Africa who built drones. Like, wow. it was one of the most inspiring stories that I had heard, you know, um, where she told me that the entire drone industry, she was the only woman. And when she went to her boss the first time and said, I want to build drones, um, the boss just laughed at her, right? So I think now MasterCard, uh, finding that opportunity that somewhere in some country in Africa, she's doing that great job. She, it's the first time she came to Dubai. She shared the stage with other entrepreneurs. It's a very small example, but again, it's a structured program with a thinking behind it, right? So these are the structured ways. These are partnership models. Uh, for example, if I have a large retailer who is looking to solve a particular pain point, and I also work with fintechs, and I know a particular fintech is only working on that pinpoint. It's about connecting the two, right. creating a business model that will drive economic value to both of them, seeing how MasterCard can come in to enhance the business model, use their assets and capabilities to drive that economic uh, equation for all three parties. So I think there are many structured programs, and then there are many things that happen because I would say they're not that structured, 
but it's about meeting a customer, understanding their pain point, and then we have like a suite of products. We have loyalty, we have our own loyalty platform. I was talking about acquisitions we made, so there are many acquisitions that are there. Payment gateway, acceptance tools, you know, gone are the days when you will ask an SME to invest in a physical terminal. Your smartphone right. or your phone is your yeah. acceptance device, right? It's a much cheaper way for SMEs to digitize their business. So those are the opportunities which we have those assets, but we have to find the right partnership where actually we can bring those assets and create a mutually, um, I would say, beneficial situation for both organizations. All right, thank you for that, Amna. Really, really great insights. I'd actually now like to open it up to the audience. Does, does anyone have any questions for Amna and Neza? Hello, yeah. Uh, I have actually a question for Amna. Uh, now, we're witnessing a rapidly evolving FinTech uh, landscape. Uh, how do you place your bets? Which wave do you decide to, weigh, uh, to write? Because uh, there are so many of them. So, um, I would say um, one aspect is understanding their product suite and their value proposition um, and their readiness, right? Um, I love dreamers, and there are many of us, um, but um, someone said yesterday when Neza was talking about pragmatic dreaming, right? How realistic is for fintech solution to scale in that particular market, right? At times, you would meet fintechs that they want to scale their solution in entire Africa. Africa is a continent, you know? Um, every country is complex, different set of regulations, consumer behavior, adoption. Some consumers are equal to, are completely fine to pay. Some have a huge aversion. So the economics would be different, right? Mobile money has taken off. They have leaped from the entire um, cards, uh, physical cards kind of uh, technology. So I think a lot of it is your, what is the business idea? How scalable it is? what kind of geographic footprint you are choosing. I love this region because I think from Turkey to South Africa to Saudi to Egypt, such different markets, you know. Uh, Saudi gives you scale in the Middle East part of the world, right? Um, but it, it is a complex market to work through, right? From an economic standpoint, regulatory standpoint, but it, it provides you innovation at scale. So it would be the scalability aspect. Last one, which is very important for us as a company is the, the strategic value. So what I mean to, to say like that is we are addressing SMEs, right? It's a very important mission for us. So even yesterday, I was um, signing a press release with a FinTech who actually is addressing SMEs pain point around expense management solutions. Um, there's another company with whom we did a tie-up, which actually is enabling SME underwriting by monetizing the data that different companies, um, they're able to collect and creating an API marketplace whereby they would share these APIs with micro lenders. Now, we would even help them with their readiness and scalability because their vision and what they're trying to do is just so powerful, right? So I think there's no like, I cannot pinpoint like this is one reason or second reason, but these are the few of the things that we would look at, and it's less about placing the bet, but it's more about how would we help them drive scale where we have a joint strategic vision or a mission to drive, or what they are doing matches with my large clients, because I know that this large retailer customer of mine in South Africa is having this pain point, and this particular FinTech is able to solve it. So then I would even go 10 steps further to make sure that this marriage happens and it's a happy marriage. And I, and I would like to add something to what Amna said. It's true, and you said it at the beginning. Some, a lot of um, tech, in general, startups, 
are scared to give a small vision. You know, it's like it needs to be big because it's tech, it's innovation. But in reality, you can have a big vision like us with the KPI of one million women to connect to jobs. But you need, we're taking a whole year of running pilots, of job readiness academies, of programs. So you, you need to have a focus plan and then you can have the big vision as a tagline. But when you're speaking to these corporations, you need to have a pragmatic plan on like, okay, how do you achieve your first 1,000 before getting to the 1 million? Thank you for that. Any other questions? That might be our last one. Uh, hello. I just wanted to know when you mentioned about you know, the selection criteria, uh, could you please list the top five in you know, a trending um, fintech uh, you know, new initiatives in this market? Sorry, did I get it right? Top fintech trends or fintech companies? No, new initiative trends. New initiative trends. Um, and I realize it more in the Jitex week, I would say SME. I think more and more fintech companies are understanding how underserved this segment is. It could be providing them with tools. It could be providing them access to credit underwriting. Um, large traditional organizations are making a huge effort but I think credit underwriting is still very traditional. Um, I met a fintech which is actually driving AI-based lending for SMEs, but they're not using the traditional data that banks use. They would partner with telcos, they would understand the bills that these SMEs are paying, they will take the invoices, they have an invoice management system, they will look into the supplier payments, they're tying up with logistic firms to understand how the merchandise is working. So I would say SME, both from tools perspective as well as um, financing. Second that I see a lot is in personalization, um, contextual, real time. Um, a lot of companies still are generating databases than having a DM or a, a digital social media campaign. These are the days that you know you can think of something in your mind that you want to buy this shoe, you can go to Instagram and that shoe advertisement is there and you're wondering like, how did it come from your mind to your screen? So uh, personalization, uh, I would say is the second one. Um, third one, uh, I would say is a lot in um, data monetization. <laughs> Connecting different players in the ecosystem and monetizing the data. Um, these three just come to my mind right now. Thank you to our audience and thank you to our wonderful panel, Amna and Neza, for your time and wonderful insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>